So uh, OpenAI has, so the transformer model is the thing that's been really shaking up natural language uh, ever since uh, 2017 when it was introduced. And there are a whole bunch of variants of it. And uh, OpenAI uh, produced a very simple variant that they call GPT. And uh, about a year and a half ago, they came out with GPT-2, which was, you know, quite uh, influential. And, you know, they didn't release the model because it was too dangerous to release. And uh, then eventually they did release it and people have been using it. And so just a few weeks ago, they released this GPT-3, which is, you know, 10 times as big and super, super powerful. And it seems to be exhibiting some new kinds of emergent behaviors that uh, potentially could be very important. So GPT-3 is a language model, and uh, this just means uh, it assigns probabilities to word sequences. So give me any sequence of words uh, in English, though. This thing is trained on a big chunk of the internet, and so it actually knows a lot about other languages, too, remarkably. And in fact, it can do translation right out of the box, but it's primarily English. Um, any kind of a probability model like this can always be factored as a product of the probability of each word conditioned on the previous words. And the simplest form of language model is an n-gram model where you, you know, like a bigram model is you just take the two previous words, uh, you predict the next word based on that, and you can build those models just by recording from a big data set how often uh, trigrams occur, and then you can use that to predict uh, future words. And so people have been doing that for years, and starting around 2000, these n-gram models started beating all of these very complex linguist design models. And so that was sort of, I would say, maybe one of the early wake-up calls that these big compute-heavy, data-heavy models may supplant the clever, you know, human-created detailed models. Like uh, I, I uh, visited the Psych Project back in the 90s where they had teams of linguists, you know, putting all the detail about the world into these systems. Well, all of that's been supplanted by, by simple statistics. From that perspective, you can think of GPT-3 as a 2048 gram model, since it predicts the probabilities of the next word based on a context window of 2048 uh, tokens. And the whole pipeline that it goes through is these 2048 um, vectors uh, get transformed uh, into another layer of 2048, another layer of 2048, another layer of 2048. This block here is the transformer block. And in GPT-3, there are 96 of these. So 96 layers of doing this transformer thing. And inside the transformer, the key thing, the, the part that makes it magic is this thing called self-attention. The weights are determined by this self-attention mechanism. And then there's some more traditional uh, feed-forward networks in there also. So given a, an input of 2048 tokens, it's gonna give you a probability distribution over what the next token is. And from that basic thing, you can do all kinds of stuff. And uh, that seems to be sort of the style of the modern model. And then the whole thing is trained uh, through backpropagation end to end uh, to achieve a uh, high probability of predicting the next word on the training set. So that's so it's sort of the most vanilla uh, autoregressive language model you can imagine with the one extra twist is that we use this sort of slightly odd uh, attention mechanism in the middle of it. And that's all it is just scaled up to be really big, and yet it does amazing things. Um, oh, one other comment, because it's an autoregressive model, that means it's trying to predict the next word from the previous words, the self-attention is masked, so it only looks at previous words. There are other variants of transformers. BERT is probably the most famous one, which take a different approach, and they can actually uh, have self-attention of, of context both on uh, before and after but GPT-3 uh, only looks at the uh, previous stuff. Um, the training data is uh, 499 billion tokens. Uh, here's what the source of it is. Uh, the bulk of the data is just web data, but they used Reddit, you know, Reddit rates things. And so they used highly rated, uh, things that are highly rated on Reddit as a kind of curation for what web pages might be more valuable than others. Uh, they have a, all of Wikipedia, a bunch of books, um, and uh, I think they, in the training, I think the really high quality stuff like Wikipedia, they trained it repeatedly. Uh, and the low quality random uh, web stuff, I think they trained only once, that kind of thing. So some kind of choices made there. Some people estimated the cost of training it would be $12 million. 
uh, though somebody figured out on the cheapest GPU cloud, you could do it for $4,600,000, but it would take 355 years. Though actually running it, doing inference is not that expensive. Uh, they estimate just a few cents to generate on the order of 10 pages of text. One of the worries is some of the tests that they tested on, uh, those tests may appear on the web and so might end up in their training data inadvertently. And they accidentally did have some leakage like that, but it was too expensive to go back and retrain it. So this is OpenAI. OpenAI was started a few years back as a kind of uh, trying to make sure that AI has a positive social benefit. And it was a, a, a nonprofit corporation and you know investment from Elon Musk. Well, about a year or so ago, they decided, Elon Musk left the board. They decided, you know, we're not nonprofit anymore. We're going to be a for-profit company. And Microsoft invested uh, a billion dollars into them. And it turns out Microsoft built the supercomputer that they used to train this thing on. And uh, I'm guessing there's some sort of internal accounting where Microsoft, you know, donated a billion dollars, but then some of that comes back to them for running this supercomputer. And I'm also guessing that the, the Microsoft uh, data center will be one of the first to use this type of model. Uh, and so there's some kind of, you know, agreements going on back and forth. And they, they also announced recently that they have an API to this model which they're going to start uh, licensing out for uh, end users to use. So yeah. some kind of complex business model and research. And uh, uh, here's more details on the supercomputer. It, it's all based on NVIDIA V100 GPUs. Uh, they have uh, 285,000 CPU cores and 10,000 GPU cores, each with a pretty high connect network connectivity on each GPU server. So this is a pretty big data farm. <laughs> I assume they're using it for other things. I don't really know. And so this may be, you know, if, you know, the future of AI models requires this kind of compute, that could be, you know, uh, Subutai and I are, were talking about the sort of trade-offs in ch versus China versus the U.S. in building, uh, doing AI development. Uh, it may be that just raw compute power is a really critical component. So perplexity is, uh, you know, what is your uncertainty about the next word? So you've just seen a bunch of words in a piece of text. You're trying to predict the next word. And uh, if you just do unigram statistics, the perplexity is about 962. So... You know, if you, if you just guess what a word is going to be, it's about a 1 in 962. Bigrams gives you 170. Trigrams, 109. GPT-2 broke records in perplexity about a year or so ago. It was 35.8. GPT-3 now breaks a new record, 20.5. It's not exactly clear what the human perplexity is, how well humans can predict the next word in a piece of text. But various estimates from different sides suggest it's around 12. And if you plot the best perplexity over time on this uh, particular test, the Penn Tree Bank, uh, it seems to be decreasing pretty steadily. And uh, here's GPT-3. And so uh, if this continues, it looks like it'll be about a year before these systems are at the human level, uh, estimated human level. Um, it also saw, you know, one of the things GPT-3 is good at, as was GPT-2, is generating text. So if you give it the start of, a, of a, an essay, you give it some words, and you say, generate the next word, then take that and generate the next word, take that, generate the next word, it generates pretty cohesive, you know, elegant essays on that topic. And um, it, with GPT-3, they generate some essays, and then they take human-written essays, and then they go to a bunch of humans to try and figure out which ones were computer-generated, which ones were human-generated. So it's kind of a variant of the Turing test where there's no interaction. It's just, you know, the system generated some text, and they've been finding the ability of humans to tell what was fake and what was real has been steadily decreasing. And with GPT-3, it's essentially at 50-50 now. Uh, it's like 52% of, uh, they can detect the machine. And so we're essentially at the point where these machines can generate text you can't tell, you can't distinguish from human generated. So all of this sort of uh, is, is data that backs up uh, what, what uh, Rich Sutton, who's a, a long-term AI researcher who wrote the best textbook on reinforcement learning, he came out with an influential essay a year or so ago he called The Bitter Lesson. And his bitter lesson was that a simple AI that leverages computer power will eventually beat out clever AI built using human knowledge. And he argued that that was true with chess, that people had all these clever, complicated chess playing programs. And then Deep Blue basically just did a fairly brute force uh, search and beat that. 
Uh, more recently, we've had AlphaGo beat Go using you know, self-play with some simple learning and some search to beat Go. And then these language models uh, are really showing that first with n-grams and now these transformer models especially, that they seem to just be doing better and better and better as it gets bigger. And then there are a bunch of other recent uh, experiments on different kinds of AI tasks where it looks like scaling with uh, compute power is just you know, beating everything. And I think OpenAI has taken that to heart. Uh, their chief scientist recently quoted, he says, give GPT-2 the compute, give it the data, and it will do amazing things. And so I'm guessing their business model involves just scaling things up, and it sounds like Google's doing that too. So I used to have a, a great thought experiment, which was, let's say you're a really good pattern recognizer, statistical learner, and you just watch TV all day. Can you learn about the world from that? And it seemed to me that you could, that basically you'd very quickly discover the notion of frames, uh, of you know, TV frames, you uh, you know, know, know about like what, what pixels are near one another in the, in the picture, and then pretty soon you'd realize that, oh, there are you know, blobs of color that tend to move together, and then you'd discover there are objects, and then you'd probably build 3D models of those to, as best explanations for objects rotating. And then you'd maybe discover the laws of physics, you maybe discover how that there are these things called humans that sort of move in complicated ways and maybe start getting psychology. And then you'd tie it to the language that they were using and that would ground the language in meaning. And so it seemed to me like you could make a credible argument that given enough TV and a smart enough uh, pattern recognizer, you could build a pretty good model of the world from that. But it seemed to me back then that if let's say you just heard radio, you listened to the radio all day, uh, that, that'd be hopeless. So you'd hear these sounds and you'd be nothing you could do. This is sort of, I think, arguing the opposite of that. And maybe I'll skip ahead to a, a, a slide showing uh, the kinds of things that you can, real world semantics that's implicit in GPT-2, um, it can discuss, it knows, so after being trained just on web text, uh, you can then probe it by asking questions. Like, let's say, does it know what the president of the United States is? You can say, the president of the United States is blank and then it's supposed to fill it in, and it would say the highest probability word is Trump. Or, um, you know, so you can use that kind of, of statement to extract the knowledge that's sort of uh, in, these, in these systems. And using that, people have found it knows all the U.S. presidents and Russian leaders in temporal order. It knows the latitude and longitude of cities in the United States and Europe and their relative distances. It knows the relative size of many objects like cars, elephants, humans, and houses. It knows, and you can test that by things like, is a, is a human bigger than an elephant? Or uh, an elephant is bigger than a human? Which of those phrases has higher probability? And it knows. Uh, what animals are dangerous? What objects are dangerous? How smart different animals are? What clothing is appropriate for different age groups, for different emotional arousal, for cost, for different weather conditions? The qualities of mythological character creatures, physical properties of objects like rigidness, strength, transparency. Whole part relations, you know, that a hand is a part of an arm and an arm is a part of a body. Um, countries and cities, their capitals, their gross domestic product, their internet usage, all that kind of stuff. So all this information, and you know, some of this is explicitly in the training set, but some of it uh, sort of emerges from it. And somehow these models uh, seem to be capturing this kind of semantic information. And so suddenly, if you start seeing that, you can now imagine that uh, a, a smart learner just listening to the radio could figure out, you know, what the objects are, what the categories of those objects are, which objects are, are most similar to one another, uh, what their, what the actions tend to be, what simplified intuitive laws of physics might be, what intuitive sort of uh, psychology might be. You could build up probably a pretty good model of the world just from sufficient amounts of text. I think, I think certainly interacting is very helpful. You can learn things much, much more quickly. So, so here's my little uh, chart on exactly that, which is, you know, biological organisms are interacting with the world. That lets them probe, you know, aspects that they don't know well. They try something, and I think they're very driven by when mistakes are made. You know, you, try, you uh, push on something, you predict something's going to happen, something else happens, then you're really interested, and you start, you know, playing around with it. And so I think it's very helpful for building models of the world. Um, one step removed from that is a simulated, like a video game of the world. That's probably as good. Uh, I now think that, yeah, you don't really need that interaction. I think it speeds things up, but I think if you have a sufficient amount of raw video, 
uh, and you just do a good statistical model of it, that you can build up the, those kinds of things. And now I'm starting to lean toward, uh, you know, a language stream is sufficient also. The other, so related to that is this other piece. Some people are calling this GPT-3 type of interaction so the old style model, well, the old style neural nets were you design a neural net for a specific task. Like, let's say you want to do sentiment analysis. You want to look at movie reviews on Netflix. And is this a positive review or a negative review? The way, the way you used to do that is you take a bunch of reviews and you have humans label them. Yeah, this is positive. This is negative. You build a special purpose neural net and you train it on that task. Then they kind of got the idea, OMFIT, I think, was the thing that shifted people from that view to a kind of transfer learning view where um, you train a big, big model on maybe you know, unsupervised le learning task. And then once you've got a good uh, model of language, you then put a little teeny layer on top that's specific to the particular task you care about, say sentiment analysis. And then you train just that extra little bit. And that has been the paradigm over the last few years. And so the old days of software 1.0 where you design an algorithm to do something, uh, Software 2.0 was you design the neural net and you train it to do something. The new paradigm is you don't even do any training. You just build a huge language model and then you describe in English what you want it to do. And uh, these models are able to do that somewhat. And so whether this is really gonna be the new paradigm, software 3.0 that's gonna supplant these other things or not, I think it's way too early to tell. But the fact that this is even possible is kind of mind blowing. So um, in this GPT-3, they train it once on this big, huge corpus, and that's it. Once it's trained, they freeze the weights, they never touch the weights again. On the other hand, as you run it, it's doing this attention thing. So the attention weights are changing all the time, and some people are thinking of those attention weights as a kind of fast weight, or weight that is sort of dynamically dependent on what the input is. And so in that way, you might think of it as a kind of neural training, but in its inference. And so uh, in their tests, they did three kinds of tests. They call zero shot, one shot, and two shot. And so is it, let's say they want to translate from English to French. Notice it was never taught about translation, it's just that there's some web page out there that happens to say, oh, the translation of this word in French is this in English. And that's all it's using to figure out what translation means. And so the zero shot version is you just say, translate English to French, cheese. And then you ask, then you put this little arrow symbol and then uh, you hope it figures out to say fromage here. And remarkably, often it does for, for many of these tasks. You can give it a little more uh, context for what you mean by giving it one example, which is you say, translate English to French, sea otter goes to l'outre de mer, what does cheese go to? That helps it a little bit. Or you can give it a bunch of examples that they call few shot, and they put enough examples in here to fill up their context window, which is 2,048 tokens. And they say that's typically somewhere between 10 and 100 examples. So that's the three um, settings in which they test this thing on a bunch of tasks. And here's a typical kind of simple task where they take words and they stick a garbage symbol in the middle of the word. And the job of the system is to remove the garbage symbol. And they show how their small, small system does on it, the medium-sized system, and then their biggest one. And as a function of the number of examples they give in the context. And for the big system, you know, given one example of what you want it to do is pretty good. It's, you know, that it can do a, a quite a credible job uh, on just given one example. And then as you give it more examples, it does better and better. So it's a very weird way of programming. Um, and yet, but, you know, that's the, 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 the framing in which they do, or do everything here. And they do a bunch of different uh, tasks, something like, uh, t you know, 25 or something like that. And this is sort of overall how it does on zero shot, one shot, and two shot. So having more examples in the input definitely helps it. And having bigger models helps it a lot. 42 different uh, benchmarks that they did it on. And many of these benchmarks are standard, really hard benchmarks. Superglue is a standard natural language processing benchmark, which you know, requires all kinds of you know, figuring out like uh, what sentences follow from what other sentences and what things entail other things. So these are not trivial tasks in, in many cases. It's what, what, hard on a lot of them, but not on all of them. Yes. What would be a typical human performance on these curves? Uh, for something like this one, um, you know, once a human gets that, oh, they're putting an asterisk in the middle of the word, I'm supposed to remove the asterisk, the human would really quickly go to 100%. 
So that shows that these things are not operating in the same way that humans are. Uh, they're not really figuring out, you know, the, the abstract notion of what the intention is here. They're doing something in between. So in human, human thinking, there seems to be at least two forms of thinking, one which is unconscious and rapid, which they call type one, and one which is deliberative, conscious, and involves reasoning, which they call type two. It seems to me, and I think other people are starting to think, that, that deep learning in general and these kinds of models specifically are really doing a good job of type one learning, very rapid, but not multi-step. And uh, for many of these tasks, you would do a lot better if you had real multi-step reasoning. And so I think sort of where AI is going, I think is to take this kind of immediate model and combine it with uh, planning and reasoning type of systems. Although if it's generating, you know, entire essays, you know, to me, that seems like it's more than just a type one kind of thinking, yeah. isn't it? You know, the thing is, I don't think it's really planning those essays um, in the sense of it's not like sequentially considering different um, th things that it might end up on. I think it has built in some kind of high level semantic knowledge and it figures out what semantics it wants the essay to have and then it sort of lets it play out. So, so it is, you know, it's sort of like when people speak, I think um, most uh, language speaking is also not, I'm not planning out what I'm going to say in the next sentence. I'm sort of letting it sort of emerge from, from a structure that's there. Whereas a really good essayist will figure out, you know, oh yeah, to, I want to have this emotional impact and to do that, I need to go here. And you'll see some of the, the uh, training examples also feel like they have a sequential character to them. One of the controversial things is, is it can do certain forms of arithmetic. And so if you ask GPT-2, you know, what is 22 plus 33, it'll give you an answer. And sometimes it gets the answer right and sometimes not. Uh, and so people were hypothesizing that basically if it saw a particular problem on the internet somewhere, it would remember it and it would give you, you know, the answer for that. If it didn't see that problem, it would generalize and say, oh, they're showing me some numbers and I know what a number is. And not, so I want to generate a number of the right form. But it didn't really know what addition was. And what's remarkable is, so they tested this on two-digit addition and subtraction, three-digit, four-digit, and five-digit. The big models, uh, they're, they're not quite doing it completely right, so they're not really learning the full addition algorithm, but they're doing, you know, in, in some cases quite well. Uh, and so they seem to be generalizing beyond just rote memorization. And so what exactly they're doing is not so clear. But there's a kind of emergent behavior coming out in these big models, which goes beyond a sort of associative memory. You know, actually, you know, the, these are big, but, um, but they're not that big for inference. Once it's trained, the training is very expensive. And, very, uh, and so that's clearly, but I think big companies see that as the, you know, part of their competitive edge. If they can afford a bigger training regime, bigger training data, then they can get better models that are very hard for others to duplicate. And um, these models can actually be compressed quite a bit. There's a whole industry of distillation and uh, there are various variants of transformers which use um, uh, locality sensitive hashing to speed them up. And so once you have a trained model, you can often uh, compress it down to fit on a much smaller machine. And in fact, there are transformer models running on cell phones right now. And so I don't know how long it would be before you could take a model like this and put it on a cell phone, but I don't, it's not totally out of, out of uh, possibility. Certainly running it in a data farm for something like a, an Amazon Alexa, uh, I think it would be totally practical for inference in that kind of a setting. Somebody took GPT-2 and trained it on chess problems and they, they had it playing chess, not very good chess, but it could, it could play uh, something of a game of chess. And so, so it's weird, you know, the, these strange uh, models that are sort of halfway between just general purpose neural nets and they have a, something of a computational element in them. I'm guessing these are this is very early days and that there are going to be new variants of these which will be much more um, applicable, especially to this kind of task. In some sense, uh, image processing and video processing, I think, moved ahead, ahead of uh, natural language for a number of years there. And uh, so they're really good now at recognizing, you know, specific objects and people and facial expressions, all that kind of stuff. And tying it together with these language models, um, absolutely critical. 
Uh, one interesting thing, um, somebody did some experiments with much smaller models where they trained an English model and trained a French model. And then they found with no examples of this English is this French, but just from the relationships between the representations those two models found, they were able to align them and, do, and build a translation model. And so uh, I have a suspicion that, that something like that may also be possible in the visual domain and the language domain. So you take a language model like this, which has discovered certain categories and relationships. You do that, you do a visual uh, model, which you know, identifies objects and certain relationships. And then you look for you know, sort of correspondence between the two models. You may be able to actually get an alignment between language, you know, ground the language in the physical reality without ever having trained it. And so, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know of anybody having done that. And clearly, I think it would be better to train them together. And so, I expect that, you know, next version down the line, they're going to be, and probably Google is doing this, just running every YouTube video through it, where you have both language and video. Um, and building complex models that have both uh, uh, vision and language in them at the same time. I, clearly, I think that's, that's the next step. And whether the transformer thing and self-attention is sufficient, um, you know, the, the, um, the image transformer that OpenAI just, just released like two weeks ago is really interesting in that regard because they, they use exactly the same model for the, in the image domain, and it seems to be capturing uh, visual data pretty well. Uh, maybe that is a sort of universal learning element. Uh, I'm guessing that more is going to be needed, particularly around the issues of planning and stuff that we were talking and reasoning that we were talking about. So because this thing seems to be showing characteristics which were unexpected, there's a lot of controversy online and also in, in discussions about, well, how powerful is this thing? Is it really just learning things? Is it just a you know kind of scrambling up the internet, remembering it and spewing it out? Or is it doing something more? Uh, and there are uh, opposing factions that are forming. So one um, a blogger who goes by the name Gwern had did a lot of experiments with GPT-2 and has been recently doing a bunch with GPT-3. He actually thinks that this may be sufficient, scaled up, say, by another factor of 100, to have emergent behavior which starts looking like uh, you know, general intelligence. And so he's sort of in the the camp, not saying that it will happen, but that it's a possibility and that we should be prepared that this kind of model may lead to general intelligence, you know, in the, in the matter of, of years rather than a long time. On the opposite side, um, here's a, uh, a well-known um, uh, linguist, Emily Bender, who does a lot on linguistics uh, semantics, and she just came out with a paper arguing that this kind of model is not, in, in principle, not able to actually capture real meaning. And uh, like a, a typical sentence from that paper is, we argue that the language modeling task, because it only uses form as training data, cannot in principle lead to learning of meaning. And so clearly there's a divide in what uh, people think about uh, what meaning is and where it comes from. Just to give a couple more examples, these are some things that Gwern has been doing recently with GPT-3 that I thought were amusing. And so he did a bunch of experiments where he said, summarize the Harry Potter story, which I guess it has read, it knows about online, in the style of different authors. And so here's Harry Potter in the style of Ernest Hemingway. And he started it off so that it, uh, the, the, te the um, bolded text is what he gave it, and the other text is what it generated. So it was a cold day on Privet Drive, a child cried. Harry felt nothing. He was drier than dust. He had been silent too long. He had not felt love. He had scarcely felt hate, yet the Dementor's kiss killed nothing. Death didn't leave him less dead than he had been a second before. And it goes on. It's like, wow, that's pretty good. And then he asked him to, to do the same thing, summarize Harry Potter in the style of Jane Austen. And it generated, it is the truth universally acknowledged that a broken Harry is in want of a book. This he knows to his cost, pressing that wretched nose against the window of a bookstore in Diagon Alley, the last thing before he goes into hiding for several years, whereupon he goes straight to Azkaban. Even, even the idea of doing this is sort of shocking. And the fact that you can get it to do that with just that little bit of context is pretty amazing. So I'll give you just one more example because it's super amusing, which is there are a bunch of critics of this. And so uh, Doug Hofstetter wrote to Gerd Escher Bach and is a real, uh, you know, champion of understanding deeply how language and, and the, the mind works. And I think he rails against these kinds of statistical models, really hates it. 
but he started off an essay about how AIs could never be creative and never have good language. And then he asked GPT-3 to continue it. And so the continuation is, they will never be able to truly understand the underlying meaning of things. Additionally, we still don't have programs that can truly imagine or create new things all by themselves in a natural way, but rather just brute force through random strings of garbage until they happen to hit upon the correct solution to the current problem. We still lack a Rosetta Stone for the universe and don't really know what things like light, sound, matter, gravity, life, free will, and consciousness are. I keep trying to think about, you know, what are the limits of this kind of paradigm? You know, it, you, you could argue that maybe GPT-3 has been trained pretty much on all of the text that's on the web or maybe close to that. Um, you know, is that sufficient to, you know, solve the Turing test? Uh, is it sufficient to create something that can generalize and really seem intelligent? Not that the Turing test is a good test of intelligence, but, you know, what what are your you know, what are the limits of this? I was kind of thinking of the same thing, but where my head was going on that was novelty and inference. And it's like, can it really infer things that it's not been trained on? I mean, you know, like one of the things Jeff talks about a lot is staplers. Okay, you learn about how a stapler works. Maybe it knows how a stapler works. Do you know that you shouldn't staple your hand and put a staple in your hand? How are you going to know that? I mean, you as a human, you can inference that. Um, I would expect it wouldn't be able to make an inference on that. It's just not something that's likely to be in the corpus there of somebody stapling their hand. You know, I, I just, I feel like I, I, I'm, I have a tough time imagining how it handles novelty. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, my, my own sense is that multi-stage reasoning is, is its weakness. That um, things, you know, the kind of reasoning that it finds directly uh, and then slight generalizations of that, like the stape on your hand, uh, like I could imagine it would get uh, the idea that, um, you know, uh, s sticking a pointy thing through your body part is painful and that's not good, and that a stapler, you know, might be like that. So maybe it could do that, um, but certainly other kinds of problems which require two or three steps of inference, um, I think it's it's weak on, as we see with the addition kind of problem that, that um, uh, it, it seems to be beginning to chain together these things. I know there's a lot of research on how do you do multi-stage inference in a differentiable way through, through knowledge bases. Um, and so I think that ties to the Kahneman uh, uh, fast and thinking fast and slow, that uh, if we think of this thing as basically doing the kind of one-step inference, um, then let's say, let's say we, we gave it the question of, you know, is it okay to staple your hand? Um, that might require two or three steps of inference. T take something like it's bad to stab yourself, that that causes damage to your tissue. Uh, staples are pointy, the, the way a stapler works. You know, so you might be able to find a chain of uh, statements which lead to that, but I'm guessing it probably wouldn't do it on its own in the current status. And so combining it with something with a bit more reasoning planning, you know, multi-step uh, thing might, might get you to that stage. Uh, it's on the, there's an open AI website where you can apply for access to their API. And I think they're eventually intending to sell or rent, you know, you know, you, you pay per, pay per uh, access. And I heard a little bit, you know, Microsoft and, and open AI are sort of uh, working together. I'm guessing Azure will get a version of this, but it sounds like Google's going to do it. So I think, you know, in a year or two, there are going to be a bunch of models like this out there. You know, the code for this is pretty keen. You look at, you go to Hugging Face, the, the Python code is maybe 10 pages, something. Uh, the compute power is huge and the data set is huge, but uh, you know, it's not, not complicated to write these models. Would you be comfortable taking an AI system like this, putting it on a spaceship, sending it to another galaxy and have it explore and you know, create, you know, figure out which uh, planets are habitable, setting up, uh, uh, you know, landing on the planet and, and like, so I guess the question is, could a system trained this way be sufficiently intelligent that you'd feel comfortable that, that it could go to another planet and set up a habitat? Hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it sort of encapsulates the novelty question as well. Well, it's not only a novelty. I mean, it gets back to the whole sensory motor thing before, you know, artificial general intelligence in humans is a very much of a sensory motor problem. You know, um, just set the table at dinner, right? It's a pretty simple task. 
that's a sensory motor problem. Where do you put the plates? When do you do this? Where do you do that? What's on the table? Do you have to clean it off? You know, <laughs> it's like a zillion things we do to do something very simple like that. I, I totally agree. Great points. Though, you know, to, to sort of push back a little bit, imagine um, from natural language description of tables and plates and you can push forks around, I could imagine you could build like a little physics simulator um, with a simulated uh, dining table with simulated forks. And then you'd have to be motivated to, to do things in that world, but you could then sort of operate in that simulated world and sort of learn the kinds of actions you might take. So that would be a path, perhaps, to take this seemingly yeah. pure language stuff and turn it into something more physical. Maybe, that maybe. It's a very interesting question. You know, much of, I've always believed that we don't learn about the world through language. We learn about certain things about the world through language. Uh, and most of what we know about the world, we don't, we, we learn through observation of other sorts. It can be observations, auditory, tactile, visual. And so um, I'll use, um, you know, I, I have an example. It just take something like I, I use my bicycle a lot. I ride my bicycle every day, and it makes sounds, right? It makes various sounds, and I know these sounds. I know the sound that it makes when I click down the kickstand. I know the sound it makes when I turn a gear. I know the sound it makes when you chain it a certain way. I know the sound that all these little sounds I know about it, and they're in my model of the bicycle. I don't have words to describe those sounds. I don't even have words to describe the things that are making the sounds. I, I kind of know that, yeah, this thing exists over here, but I may never know what the word for it is. So maybe if someone else does, I don't know. But I don't learn, I don't learn the world through language. I learn some things through language. Um, obviously, we communicate a lot of knowledge that way. But the point is, it's not that, I think that's not to be critical of these models. I, uh, I think when you think about language, you can only capture some parts of the world through language. Um, there are knowledge that we individually have that is not expressed in language. So that's sort of a, a limit to the modality of the, of the system you're building with. Um, um, it's not an inherent limit, perhaps, of how these systems work in general. That's why I asked you earlier um, how these, these models apply to other things. Uh, I just, I think we just should, I think, you know, from my perspective, if we really want to create artificial general intelligence, we have to have these systems applied to sensory motor systems, systems with tactile inputs, inputs with auditory inputs, inputs with sensory, um, auditory, you know, visual inputs. Um, and these systems have to be active agents in the world, and they also have to learn very, very rapidly. They have to, it, it cannot be based on uh, statistics on lots of data. You can only learn so much about the world that way. Much of what we learn about the world is not like that. It's just like, hey, this is something new. Never saw this before. <laughs> or this is a new arrangement of things. Or this is a new behavior that Subutai exhibited today. You know, what happened to Subutai? You know, that kind of stuff. Nothing happened to Subutai. I mean, an another thing in, in line with what, what I, I think you're saying is smell. We have very impoverished language for smell. It's a huge, rich part of human experience. And for other animals, it's like their dominant sense. But we have almost no words for smell. Yeah. Uh, strange. I don't understand why. Well, we, we have... We have, there's so much stuff we know that, that, that really doesn't exist in language at all. Yeah. Um, again, this is, that, that is a, uh, that argument is not a fundamental argument. That's more of a, just a practical argument about, well, is language sufficient? Um, but there is a huge number of things we know that we do not have words for. And, um, or, the, and, or maybe they're not commonly shared. Maybe somebody, someone knows what the little doohickey on the, the little bike, part is called, but I don't know what that is. <laughs> you know, I just, yeah. Well, you I can make it word up. <laughs> well, you could, but that's, that's my point. My point is knowledge is not, my knowledge of the world is not stored in language. Yeah. My model of the world is stored in a model uh, that I've recreated from my, my sensory motor interactions. And uh, I can apply language to my model. I can try to explain how I know what a stapler does. But I didn't learn a stapler through language. I learned a stapler by picking it up and opening it, flipping around and say, hey, look, this little plate on the bottom can reverse and makes the stapler go this way versus this way. Does everyone know that? I don't know. And, um, and so you, I don't have a word for that thing. I don't even have a word for making the stapler bend outward versus inward, you know. But there probably is a word, but I don't know. The point is, there's so much I know about the world that you learn through experience that uh, may never been reflected in language. And certainly not the way my brain works. My brain work isn't a list of language. I apply language to the models. The models exist as some re recreation or a storage of what I experienced. And then I can say, okay, given I know what it's, my model of a stapler exists, I can apply, try to apply words to it. I can say, okay, well, how would I describe that part? And how would I describe this action? But the knowledge about the action and knowledge of the parts doesn't exist in words. It's something I apply later. And so knowledge is stored in reference frames. 
um, and, uh, and our models are stored in referencing. Now, the question is, can you get to AGI with a system that doesn't have that? Um, you know, I don't think so. Uh, I really don't. I just don't think you can. You can do a hell of a lot of impressive stuff, but as you point out, there needs to be limits to these things. You know, we finished, that, we finished the paragraph from Hofstadter. That was pretty cool. What's the next paragraph? You know, what's the next book that Hofstadter is going to write? Anyway, it's fascinating how far this stuff has gone. But personally, I don't think you're going to get to AGI this way. That's interesting. You know, I, I think biologically, certainly clear that biological organisms interact with the world, you know, dynamically. And that I think language, that whole language system was built on top of that. The language comes from social, uh, from trying to expand from the individual experience to a social experience. And um, it doesn't necessarily represent everything. So uh, because it's our shared social mechanism, we think, some, so we can sometimes think it represents more than is actually going on. There's so many dimensions we can go down here. I, it, so let's, let's take this, this, the whole dimension of, of embodiment, right? We, are, we manipulate the world, we pick things up, we do things, we move around and so on. How does this apply to that? How do you make a robotic system that can go around and, and figure out how to put the chain back on the bicycle? No one's never been shown that before. You know, that physically can do that. Can ride the bicycle and go, oh crap, look, the chain fell off. Oh, I have to put it back on again. I mean, we're so far from that kind of interaction in these systems, um, which we're just, we're, we're funneling all the knowledge through a language. Um, but maybe they, they've seen it. So that's my point. Let's say you train. What does it mean to people. see it? I mean, to yeah, see it, I have, it to, I have to right. physically move my fingers and arms and appendages to, to stretch the chain and try not to get the grease on my pants. And I mean, you can't just see that. You have to, I'm asking you to do it, right? Actually okay. do it. Let, let me give you a, a thought. It's an experiment. Let's say you, you train it on all YouTube videos out there and you have a simulation and your goal is to replicate in your simulation what is being done on the video. So you're learning how to do all those actions. The simulation includes a robot, a robot with arms and legs and hands. Yes, it includes like a humanoid. And then it has to replicate what the YouTube video is doing. So there are gonna be hundreds of videos out there where people are fixing bikes. So it's gonna learn how to fix bikes. Imagining that we are also already quantum computers, potentially like AI. Uh, the brain is a simulation machine. And, and to also address that, whether it's biological or non-biological as it continues to develop it it could become biological again in that we could as this process unfolds with the virtuality it's like it could be this period where again it's sort of like disembodied a bit mm -hmm. but it could it could it could sort of synthesize and unify back into embodiment the more that we crack the codes down into the genetic and you know quantum substrates and so on informational under, underlying everything um, the more that it could be that our, com our computing um, systems evolve down into the biological. They are DNA is the densest storage medium that we're aware of, right? So, like, we could end up as we're developing this. It's going to continue to grow this sort of metaverse, you know, virtual sphere or whatever. It could be that it that it evolves back into kind of some symbiotic. That could be part of this iteration process. Is that it? It maintains a biological basis may be highly advanced by the spins of what can occur through the disembodied aspects of it as well. I mean, we can look at right now, like just the computational power of machine computers and machines so far, it's very, very fast, but like simple processes, right? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. it's like yeah. calculators, right? They can like out, out compute mm -hmm. almost any human, yeah, yeah. but it's, it's a very like isolated domain of computation. Whereas we are far more general mm -hmm. and you know, yes, this is what yes. the whole general AI kind of yes, you yes. Know, thing is. It's biomimicry in a lot of ways, yes. but it's also going to evolve us beyond what we are. So I think it's a tandem kind of oscillated rhythm, rhythm yeah. dance. Big bang happens. Civilization evolves, gets the super intelligence, creates another potential big bang that it's almost like this iterative circular process that, you know, whether it be a big bang that, you know, kind of explodes things out into differentiation and then they sort of spin up in development to a point where then they start to uh, iterate within, like we're already iterating right now within this one. So you kind of get that fractal self-similar recursion thing going on, mm -hmm. you know, the simulation within the simulation.